Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us online. This is uh, yet another lecture of solidarity from our now regular sessions of Global Minds for Ukraine. We broadcast from different locations. I am uh, talking to you from my apartment in Kiev, Ukraine. I'm uh, staying here uh, despite some airstrikes uh, hitting um, residential areas yet again. Uh, tonight, and um, and despite I hear some uh, shooting and combats, um, I I hope that you know I can stand strong as other Ukrainians, people who stay in different cities, and preserve a sense of normality and uh, solidarity to other Ukrainians during this terrible invasion. Uh, we are scholars, academics, and we want to show our solidarity with other Ukrainian researchers and students, especially with those uh, academics whose faculties and uh, campuses were bombed in Kharkiv, in uh, Chernihiv, in Mariupol. And to do so, we invited in influential intellectuals from all around the world um, to give a lecture or just to talk to us about things that are important for shaping contemporary democracy, media space, economic development. And I'm very happy and honored to have Thomas Reed today with us. He is a professor of strategic studies and he's also a founding director of Alperovich Institute for Cybersecurity Studies at John Hopkins University. Um, he has written many books, but his most recent book called Active Measures, The Secret History of Disinformation and Political Warfare. Um, it was published in 2020. It has been well received in different countries. It was translated in many languages. And I hope today we can discuss some uh, major takeaway messages from this book. Uh, talking about this information, its historical origins, uh, the dynamic, how it progresses, and how it influences uh, the United States, but also other countries. So, um, Thomas, uh, thank you very much for being with us today and sparing some time to talk to me and my students. Uh, perhaps you can say a few words about yourself and your book, and then I will um, engage in, in a conversation. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Timothy. Um, First off, I, I just want to express how um, humbled I am to be uh, with you today uh, in this in this um, remote session with you in Kiev and me in Washington. I am, uh, you know, German born I'm from Berlin, and um, and I've been like many of my colleagues here and many of my friends here uh, glued to social media and uh, news coverage of the war of what's happening in Kiev and Ukraine. In a, and I think we all, and we talk about it with my students, literally, um, in every session, it's dominating the conversation. And it, I think we all understand that we are looking at history, looking at an event that will define the 21st century like nothing before it, more, more than the 9-11 even. So I think uh, uh, we all appreciate the gravity of the situation and the personal uh, sacrifice, of course, and stress it's causing to, to you and your your country uh, compatriots. So uh, a lot of respect to you, uh, first off, and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I wrote this book. Uh, sorry, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, I think we can improvise. Uh, thank you for, for saying that. Uh, um, yeah, uh, please, can you tell just briefly about this book? Maybe, uh, you know, I, I would be happy just even if to promote it, because here people in Ukraine are uh, eager to learn new knowledge, and uh, perhaps we can, you yeah. know, just attract some attention to your book and uh, influence yeah. some people to translate it. But yeah. then we will talk about the content and your ideas in details. Yes, and of course, Ukraine and your president uh, right now, President Zelensky, was implicated in disinformation, um, famously in the phone call with President Trump. Um, and uh, so I think Ukraine probably has a unique perspective, unique perspective, first off, uh, because it is, you know, formerly part of the Soviet Union, which is was the most prolific pro produ producer of disinformation. So many of, I suspect that some of your um, 
uh, your parents and grandparents will remember uh, disinformation in in a very different, more personal fashion than those born after uh, uh, you know 1990. Um, and of course, also the, so I was early on in the 2016 election interference when Russian military intelligence, DRU, escalated. And um, they, of course, had been engaged in, in disinformation operations and deception and active measures in Ukraine and elsewhere for many years before um, 2016. But in 2016, when they escalated and targeted Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party and various staffers around Clinton. Um, I was investigating a, an older Russian uh, campaign and a hacking campaign and was closely watching the evidence coming out. And it was very interesting because it was very clear from literally from the first day, from the first leak, when this mysterious entity calling itself Gucci for two leaked information. Um, it was very clear that uh, it was a uh, it was a GRU operation. The, the evidence was open, so they made very major mistakes from day one, operational security mistakes, just bad tradecraft. So what we saw was not very impressive, and um, and yet it had an impact on the conversation in the U.S. So that was, you know, my book was published in 2020, and really the most confusing years was not. The most confusing time was not when the Russian disinformation happened in 2016. That was uh, in some ways not, uh, not that confusing for experts, but really what became very confusing is the narrative about disinformation in the years that followed. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating also to think about the history of disinformation, because you pointed out that Ukraine was a part of Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was a producer of uh, disinformation uh, for many years. Um, I actually can share some personal stories about this. So when I, I was born in uh, 1987, so technically I was born in the Soviet Union. Uh, nevertheless, I grew up in the independent Ukraine and I attended uh, public school in this new independent Ukraine. And our textbooks about history and literature were quite different from those that my parents got. And I remember we had many discussions with adults and I just realized that we have a very different understanding of our history and key crucial events and even names. Uh, for instance, um, you know, my parents did not know uh, about poets and uh, writers uh, who were very prolific in 1920s and 1930s uh, because they were uh, killed by the Soviet regime, they were oppressed nor yeah. many uh, adults knew about uh, famine, uh, which we now call Holodomor, uh, which caused deaths of uh, more than 4 million of Ukrainians by hunger. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an interesting observation for me because I personally experienced this long-term shadow of disinformation. Yes, something that was launched maybe decades ago still influenced uh, people from the next generations because people were passing by this common knowledge uh, and it actually affected um, relationship within families because some people receive knowledge from their parents or official textbooks but I received from another textbook and it was very difficult to you know to locate yourself within these different narratives uh, yeah. yes this was a very broad uh, uh, no, introduction I, for me, but but I guess what I want to ask, uh, and maybe you can reflect it, you know, from from writing your book, how deep in history it goes. Uh, so disinformation. Usually, people think that this is something that pre mostly related to our era of social media. You already said about Soviet Union, but did it go? How, can we trace back this phenomena even? farther to history or is this uh, a phenomenon which describes only modern societies can you uh, reflect yeah. on that yeah that's a really hard question you're asking there because disinformation it depends on what we uh, define disinformation to mean and of course if you simply look at 
spreading information in a, in a systematic fashion that is false or misleading or deceptive, then there's really no limit uh, uh, to, to what, how far you want to go back. Um, you know, you could even look at the, at the church in the Middle Ages as, a, as, a, as, an, as an entity in that context, but let's not go there. So what I did in my book is I, I looked at professional deceptive uh, operations or sometimes disinformation actually contains a lot of truth um, and not just uh, forgeries and lies deceptive professional operations by intelligence entities intelligence services and that story really takes off in a, in a, in a systematic uh, in a coherent way in the 1920s with uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky the founder of the Cheka in and later KGB, obviously in uh, in in Russia, because the Russian and really important to understand here is that initially their approach to deception was an existential one because they had to defend the Russian Revolution against uh, counter revolutionary movements um, from both within Russia but also from emigres from the White Russians from abroad. So it's that existential aspect and really also a totalitarian aspect that still characterizes authoritarian aspect that still characterizes disinformation to this day. Um, and I, I was thinking as I, as I was preparing for, you know, for this meeting with you, um, Timothy, I was, I was thinking maybe we should talk a little bit about um, one widely known historical case that played out in the context of a pandemic. And that is the AIDS uh, disinformation story, the myth that AIDS is an American engineered bioweapon because of course today we again are talking about you know mythical bio weapons and bio labs at this time in ukraine of course and i thought it might be helpful to contrast the bio bio labs narrative today uh, with the um bio uh, with the aids myth yeah absolutely because i had this impression that when i heard first time uh, about this present day Russian narrative that perhaps Ukraine is planting some bioweapon against Russia, which is justification for Russia to attack Ukraine in order to avoid this in the first place. When I heard it first time, in my mind, I connected it with some recent um, narratives about the pandemic that uh, the pandemic itself was created in the lab somewhere in the China. And my naive idea was that maybe Russian government just tries to echo all possible weird theories around the world just yeah. to send some domestic uh, domestic message to maybe distract domestic population thinking that they will buy anything which is uh, somehow related to, to these popular uh, conspiracy mm -hmm. theories. But as far as I understand, your message is that it goes even deeper in history, yeah? and it can be traced to some narratives from the um, disinformation of Soviet Union. So can you elaborate on this, please? Yeah, um, it, yes. So let, let, let's talk about the this. So, so here in the US, and I think that the same may be true in many other countries in Germany also, for sure, it's true. Um, when, you know, when you meet people over, when you meet your family over dinner and, and and they ask you, what do you do in university? And you mention, you know, that you just wrote a book about disinformation, for example, they will, of course, not be familiar with the uh, history, but except they know one case. And that is the pop, very widely popularly known uh, story that the Soviet Union pushed this narrative in 1982. Five, um, really an effective, in an effective way that AIDS is man-made in the USA um, in Fort Detrick, Maryland, not far from where I am. Um, and so I think it's worth just looking at how did the story, this narrative emerge? And if we zoom in, what we see is that the uh, Red Army was, and the Soviet Union was, um, using chemical weapons in Afghanistan uh, after the invasion of Afghanistan in 1980. And was also, um, in fact, also in, uh, in, in Laos, uh, gave a chemical weapon to combatants in, La in Laos in South Asia. But the, the Afghanistan one is the most important one. So in that context, what we see very early in the 1980s is, very, very, is also locally active measures campaigns in Pakistan and India 
to distract from the use of chemical weapons in in uh, in Afghanistan and to blame on the United States that it was manufacturing biological weapons for example in Lahore and Pakistan that was a story that they pushed quite aggressively in the early 80s and the the narrative that AIDS is a man-made bioweapon was then modified out of this campaign um, to distract from the Soviet's Soviet Union's own bio biological weapons program and, and use of those weapons in Afghanistan. That's the first interesting aspect here. But the second interesting aspect is that the pandemic or the AIDS uh, disease was only emerging in, 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 in the early 1980s. And at the time, um, people were very confused about what that thing is. It affected homosexual men, and some immigrants from Haiti, for some reason, um, um, that, that there was an early cluster, and people just did not understand the virus yet. It was uh, it was just the, the the kind of like in the early days of COVID when we all were so scared of what could happen because we didn't really understand the virus yet. So you had a similar dynamic in the early 1980s. Of course, instead of masks, uh, we learned uh, later we have to uh, you know protect ourselves in in. By, by you know wearing condoms and almost equally um equally uh intimate uh interference in in, in our personal decision making like like you know that is an important component because it drove fear it drove confusion and it drove very emotional reactions to 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 the disease and to the way um governments try to counter the disease later on so but early on in the in the aids pandemic the First, uh, people who articulated the conspiracy theory, the myth, the false narrative that AIDS is an American-made weapon were activists on the far left, um, gay rights activists, who felt very discriminated against by the US government and who did had a, you know, didn't really trust the authorities. And they were the first to articulate this conspiracy theory in explicit terms in writing and, you know, community magazines at the time. And indeed, we have some indications that KGB picked up the conspiracy theory in the in the in New York or in the on the in the uh, on the East Coast in the United States, and then amplified it, modified it a bit, made it sound more professional, you know, they added some value to it, no question, but they picked it up, they didn't come up with it on their own. That I think is a really powerful uh, thing to observe because ultimately that story was not just a Soviet disinformation story. It really was an American disinformation story already that of course interacted with professional intelligence officers and what they did with it. Oh, that's fascinating. Sorry, if I interrupt, I just no. want to say another observation. So it seems like it's a very common strategy and it's a very successful strategy that the real disinformation should be seeded in a fertile soil. Yeah, it, it cannot be very yeah. um, um, foreign to, to people who, who, who are targeted. Yeah, And yeah. Um, in a way that um, what we experience right now in Ukraine, we also have quite a lot of disinformation uh, from Russia, and it seems that they also try to target uh, pre-existing fears or pre-existing um, um, subjects that could polarize society. Uh, okay. So I guess that's why uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, the, maybe you know a very simple question. But in your book, have you investigated maybe the uh, the playbook of KGB? Do they? Do they actually have a strategy? Do they write it down as a yeah. uh, as a textbook for younger KGB students? That you want, uh, do they teach this in the KGB school? Yeah. The best yeah. successful strategies of uh, of creating disinformation. Yeah, uh, yeah. So first, I think it's important to appreciate that for that AIDS disinformation story, we actually have several original KGB memos that survived in archives in Bulgarian archives, actually, because they cooperated with the Bulgarians in Sofia. And so we, we know exactly what, like, why they did this and, and how they ordered their partners to help. And what we also have in those Bulgarian archives, a German researcher discovered those, Christopher Nering, um, are memos, a lot of paper, 
a lot of um, like memos and archival records on how to do this information, on the art and craft of disinformation, as they themselves, as KGB uh, called it. And for example, what you see there in those uh, lectures that they gave in, to their partners in Moscow when they visited is, um, is exactly what you are implying. It's exactly what you're saying in the sense that they knew that you want to have the proposal for a new operation should start in the field, should start on the ground in local residenturas of the KGB, say in New York or in Berlin or in, you know, wherever they wanted to um, launch an operation because you needed people on the ground who are in touch with activists, who are listening to new cultural trends, who are listening to conspiracy theories, who see where the ground is fertile, to use your metaphor and then start seeding uh, disinformation stories in that fertile ground. Um, so that I think is a, something that is still happening today, of course, but, but today it's happening in a very different technological environment where you can, um, where you can gather more information uh, more quickly through social media and other, other ways. Um, so that I think is a fascinating dynamic here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing which you also pointed out, uh, you actually identified quite specific actors of uh, this story. Yeah, you said that uh, uh, left-wing activists who were critical to the government were first to debate and discuss this um, theory publicly. And today when people discuss Russia and Russian disinformation, uh, at least uh, from what I heard, that experts very often point out that Russia successfully targets very different groups on the political specter, that uh, yeah. right-wing activists and left-wing activists, they, can, they all uh, support or consume Russian disinformation. Um, so, so it seems that Russia has mastered uh, this micro-targeting uh, when they communicate this information to different groups. So I guess my broad question, what, what's happening now in the United States? Is this about left-wing, right-wing, or all across the board groups? Yeah. So I think the risk here, and this is the historical novelty, if we compare, for example, the uh, bio-weapon lab story today, bio, la bio labs in Ukraine to the AIDS myth in the 1980s. It's interesting to look at the similar, uh, similarities and differences. So yes, the, what we see today is also that most likely the Russian government picked up the story initially um, earlier this year, actually, from um, conspiracy theory circles from QAnon and far right uh, activists in the in the US who again surfaced this, this narrative. It's not a the narrative periodically surfaced. Um, for example, in 2015, uh, Russian state television did a major story on bioweapon labs in Georgia, in, uh, in the Repu Republic of Georgia, as well as in Ukraine. Um, that was you know, obviously before the pandemic. Um, but already, uh, as the Ukraine uh, crisis slowly sort of es escalated, was already escalating from their perspective. So it's not a new narrative, but earlier this year, in January, February, it began to bubble up again in right-wing um, conspiracy uh, circles in the United States. And it was the, from there, it was ultimately, and remember, Putin initially didn't mention it in, in his articulation of war goals or justification for the war. It, only, it came in only later, after activists, and in fact, also the Chinese government had mentioned it, um, prominently. And so I think therein lies a really important lesson for us. And the lesson is that and in a way you, the way you just phrased your question, I think is also potentially a little problematic because the risk is, the risk is that we overstate Russian and Chinese, in fact, but especially Russian disinformation skills, that we overstate how powerful they are. Um, and certainly that is a, as a problem here in the US right now, because a lot of people default to the assumption that they think Russia and Putin are so shrewd and so clever and so powerful in shaping American narratives. That is not borne out by the evidence. In fact, they're quite incompetent in many, many contexts. 
I mean, if I may just elaborate on that point for a moment, you know, consider how Putin's line of denazification in Ukraine played out. I mean, obviously it was an insult to Zelensky, who was Jewish. It was an insult to Ukrainians, uh, to most Ukrainians, I would suspect. But really, it was also an insult to me personally. I mean, my own grandparents fought in the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front. Um, And, you know, calling this campaign a denazification is an insult to Germans who actually are descendants from real Nazis. It's an insult to every European who and who are, is essentially a descendant of people who had to fight real Nazis. So think about this. Putin was stealing the spine of Europe, was really making it easy to unify Europe against Russia and in order to help Ukraine. That was he basically helped Ukraine by by articulating such a really such a dumb uh, justification. Um, and so why should we give him credit for being so shrewd on the information operations frontier? Yeah, I think um, you hit into a very important uh, point here because um, it's a general tendency to overestimate uh, Russian uh, authorities in many ways. Yeah, so a lot of people believe that their army and military capacity is much stronger than it seems in practice. Uh, we, people who live in Ukraine, we for many years debated and tried to uh, articulate the idea that even Russian uh, culture is not so well developed as people perceive it, because Russia, Russia Russia's authorities um, played in this game of cultural appropriation, appropriating culture of Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, and so forth. I think a lot of people now opening their eyes in terms of sport achievement that where Russians also uh, do not play uh, fair very often. And now we also see that they're not so much competent in their disinformation. So somehow the whole world is waking up to this realization that maybe uh, we were under false impressions. And yet I still um, think about uh, something else, and I'd like to know your opinion about it. I have always had this my own, you know, kind of intuition, this gut feeling, maybe you can, you know, uh, reflect on it, that most of what Russia is doing in media and information is mostly for domestic audience. So uh, they just perhaps want to protect themselves in terms of regime. So uh, Russian elites just uh, need more legitimacy. Uh, and perhaps they're just feeding their own population with these stories to, to support what they're doing. So when they say, when Putin says about the nazification, it's not to, he doesn't care about you or me, but he wants to ensure some legitimacy that the Russian population is going to support him. And just like many other um, conspiracy theories and disinformation that existed even before. Uh, for instance, this very famous um, myth about little boy, a child who was crucified in Ukraine uh, during the war in 2015. This was this, this news was distributed through all major Russian TV channels. And of course it was an insult to all Ukrainians. Of course, how can you imagine someone crucifying a little boy? And, but I think it was a very powerful message for the domestic audience just to justify what political elites are doing. So, Mm. How do you do you think my intuition, I don't know, is, is justified? Can you can you reflect on that? Yeah, again, a really difficult question. Um, my my feeling there is that also historically you see that at play. You see disinformation or narratives about justifying, you know, whatever needs to be justified. Um, You you see the same thing in the GDR. You know, I studied that in East Berlin myself after, obviously, the wall came down. Um, uh, You see that in 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 the in all in Eastern Europe in Eastern Europe as well uh, during the time of the Soviet Union in different countries that the domestic audience was an absolutely critical audience. But I think we should also avoid falling into that trap in Russia today to think that the domestic Russian audience is a unif- is, is, is one coherent entity, which obviously it is not. Um, and we also shouldn't assume, I think that Russia, that Putin, the regime is able to control uh, 
domestic perceptions completely. That was never really ultimately possible, even in the Soviet Union and or in, in the GDR in East Germany. So uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I think uh, you're probably right that um, domestic consumption sometimes is number one priority, but that doesn't mean that uh, back international you know effects shouldn't should also be taken into account. And if he plays you know the denazification uh, theme for a domestic audience, then you know it's still rather uh, naive to think it wouldn't backfire internationally uh, in a in a massive way, which it did. So yes, internet domestic audiences are important, but that doesn't mean we should we that we shouldn't assess uh, these operations for their international impact, especially because, and that is a historical pattern, there was always, um, especially in Russia. Um, it, it was always a fluid line between domestic and international audiences. It really goes back ultimately to the role of the Russian diaspora in uh, immediately after the uh, revolution, which was a key target, international target for domestic, uh, for their disinformation uh, operations. So the line between domestic and international because of the emigres, because of the whites, was quite fluid from, from the beginning. And in a way that was carried on throughout the Soviet Union also because of its ideal, its international ideology. Oh, that's interesting. Um, interesting point about diaspora because I know that right now there is a very big debate around the world um, in terms of sanctions, and some of the sanctions they target not only economic activities in Russia but also uh, academic and cultural activities. There are quite a lot of institutions that have decided to cut. Um, ties with Russian laboratories or Russian universities. Um, at the same time, I, as a sociologist, I study religion and I also have uh, collected some you know, reports and data that show that Russia has used uh, Russian Orthodox Church as an element of soft power. So my question would be in your book or maybe in some other papers and articles which you've written, have you ever um, addressed this issue of soft power? So it's not just about KGB agents but or diaspora, but maybe there are some other actors who willingly or not willingly support this information and promote this information around the world, universities, intellectuals, religious yeah. actors. Can you, can you say yeah. something about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the 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 which really relates to this earlier theme that we touched on. What is different today from from you know back in the early 1980s or back in the 60s when there was a very aggressive push uh, from Soviet from the Soviet um, security establishment in terms of active measures. What di what's different today, I think, is that it's much harder um, for any intelligence agency to really control the narrative. Because today, obviously, there's such a rich, um, sub, so many different subcultures that produce their own uh, perceptions, that produce their own narratives, that produce their own, sometimes just straight out con conspiracy narratives. Um, QAnon is a very powerful, internationally well-known example that is US, uh, strongly US influenced by US, I, I don't mean US government, obviously, I mean by US communities here. Um, that in some times are quite pro-Trump. Um, uh, and, and that I think is a, is a fundamental, I mean, it's not really soft power in the way you meant it in your question, but um, I think the risk today is that some you know, observers, and that includes many academics and you know, experts, and think tanks and whatnot, they are trained and predisposed to look at what foreign governments are doing, especially in Washington, that is a common phenomenon. But I think it, you also find it in academia. We, we study you know, Russia, we study China, we study Iran, for example, because that's kind of what we've been doing for many years. And then we suddenly see that they come up with a, a narrative or a campaign or some form of influence campaign that um, looks new to us, but in fact, it's not new. It's something that has been bubbling under, under the surface and that has already achieved prominence among, you know, B, you know, B, B list celebrities in those subcultures and has already been swept up on various platforms, social media platforms, or even Twitter, one of the more mainstream platforms. So I think the trick that we are playing on us is that we think their operations are more creative, 
um, and more influential than they really are. Because what we're really seeing is, is our domestic uh, trends. And one of those domestic trends I just want to point out, because it's really quite scary, and it's happening in the US, uh, but it's also happening in many European countries. And that trend, and I suspect it's linked to the rise of the internet and internet subcultures, political subcultures, conspiracy cultures. That trend is that we have assumed a language of enmity. We're not talking about political opponents anymore so much at home. We're talking about enemies. And the, draw, the lines are drawn in a fairly static way. You know, you hear stories of Americans uh, having an issue with their kids dating somebody, you know, in theory, from the other side of the political spectrum. Because it's so, because, because the, um, um, because the political lines and fronts are drawn in such stark fashion. And so this notion of that the enemy is the domestic, you know, when, for example, you see on the far right um, here, I listen to, sometimes I listen to you know, pretty extreme material like the uh, Steve Bannon podcast called War Room. And when you see how he immediately uses Russian or Chinese talking points and reorients them into the enmity that defines his identity, into the opposition, into the adversity that defines who he is as a person and what he does um, as a person, that is the enmity against the left, against the liberals in the United States, against Biden. That is a very problematic trend because once we see our pr pr prime enemy as at home, and once we are, lose the capacity to change to essentially agree with our political opponents on important matters, then I think we're entering a path that leads towards political violence. And I think we're firmly on that path in the United States right now and should work harder to get off it. Yeah, and of course, this is such a complicated issue. Um, I'm also kind of think about, you know, uh, some comparisons with Ukraine because Ukraine uh, was also um, perceived as a polarized society in terms of political debates. And yet, uh, in the face of um, war, uh, it seems like a very unified society. So I wonder whether this is a, just a, some general phenomena that any society can be unified uh, under the threat of some you know, significant um, uh, danger or something like that. Or perhaps there should be some additional um, specific structural conditions to, to promote such unification. And I can offer a couple ideas on my own. Um, mm -hmm. From what I, you know, I see and what I have discussed with my colleagues, um, Ukraine has, um, has made quite a lot of progress in terms of combating uh, disinformation and fake news after uh, 2014, yeah, after the um, occupation of Crimea and also war in Donetsk and Luhansk, mm -hmm. we have collectively invested in new organizations and institutions that, um, that protect information. Uh, for instance, several universities and NGOs uh, created new fact-checking organizations which did not exist before. And um, there was a very highly polarized debate about freedom of speech and um, shutting down certain TV channels. Uh, so for the context, um, it used to be the case, or maybe it is still the case, that a large uh, national TV channels were basically owned by big uh, oligarchic groups. Uh, and uh, competitive oligarchs used media to compete with each other. Um, so we had competitive media narratives. And some of these narratives were extremely pro-Russian. So uh, the president Zelensky made a very strong move to shut down these media channels, which was perceived as an attack on freedom of the speech. Yeah, you cannot shut down the channel if you don't like the narrative. Yeah? And nevertheless, surprisingly, somehow it increased our resilience because right now in, in the face of war, I, um, what happened is that all major media channels in Ukraine, they united in one uh, consortium uh, immediately. It was day number one of war. 
they all united in a consortium and now they coordinate with each other and they have this 24 7 broadcasting about the war they substitute each other they share information with each other and this is a very uh, strong institution to protect uh, media mm -hmm. and information flow but this could not have happened uh, you know, with some free riders and with some yeah. uh, weaklings. So apparently this decision to shut down these channels somehow helped now, even though it was perceived as a wrong one. So mm -hmm. I understand. So, yeah, so there are so many tiny and complicated details here. Basically, we are talking that there should be some culture. Yeah, people should know how to talk to each other and uh, find dialogue. There should be some institutions like... Uh, um, fact-checking organizations and there should be some uh, understanding of how media um, sphere works yeah so you, you you cannot allow free riders and those who break rules uh, to be present but mm -hmm. how to identify them yeah and how, it, it's a one it's a million uh, dollar question so i guess what i want to ask do in your book do you have any you know advices or policy suggestions how can we improve our societies to be more resilient against this information? You know, I think you and me um, as academics, uh, many of the journalists that you spoke about uh, um, share, and, and in fact, many government officials who work, for example, in law enforcement or in the, in the criminal justice system, um, they, we are all part of an investigative community, I think. We're all part of a of a culture, of a subculture of people who, pre, who prize and value evidence and facts over anything else. And especially as scholars and you know, researchers and scientists, we uh, have a culture of appreciating that we um, may be wrong and have to change our assessment in response to, or I, our hypothesis in, his, in response to better evidence that is becoming available, for example, in a trial. Uh, or experimental situation. So it's all about facts and the truth and it change and improve, improving our knowledge in response. But there's a different type of community out there, um, a different type of ideal of the truth. And that is more emotions driven. It's more normative driven. It's about, and you know, you're a, you're a student, a uh, scholar of religion. So this will, I suspect, resonate with you because uh, religious truth also has that has that aspect. Um, and I think active measures really, they're designed, the active part is the interesting uh, adjective here. They're designed to activate an emotional response. And whether something is factually correct or not is irrelevant. Sometimes it's helpful if something is partly factually correct. What's powerful and what's, what's desired and what you want to achieve is to activate an emotional reaction in your target audience. That's the fertile ground point we made earlier. And I think therein lies a huge challenge. Uh, so, you know, studying active measures is really studying how, these, how this emotional activation works. But of course, in a wartime context, like the one you're in right now, I suspect that a lot of communication that is coming from the Ukrainian side is also... I mean, it's, it's very emotionally extremely powerful. That is one of the reasons why I'm, you know, um, pulled in uh, so much and many of my, our colleagues are because the, the moral choices in this war are so clear. It's like one president who is the voice of Paddington Bear versus another president who is poisoning his opponents with radioactive um, materials. So, I mean, it couldn't be clearer really. Um, but, 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 but therein also lies a risk and that's the really important point, because I suspect that after the war, it will be extremely important, really existential for Ukrainian democracy to pivot back from a, from a mode of communication that is very powerful and optimized for emotional effect, because that is so important right now. We would all do the same thing if we were as good as it as your president. Um, but at some point, it has to be it's important to pivot back into a fact-based um, mindset again, like the one that I think we professionally share. That that that's sort of where I would take this. I don't know how does that sound to you. No, that sounds uh, about right. Especially it resonates with something that I mentioned about these fact-checking organizations that were um, that were created 
specifically in 2014 and 15. So I think that quite a lot of Ukrainians in the you know professional community, but also in media community and in among politicians understand that we should create institutions in the time of crisis, because then institutions will protect us. So the idea that you should invest in smart reforms um, is uh, is not new to, to Ukrainian political establishment. Yeah, after 2014-15, we, we witnessed a, a very significant reform uh, which improved National Bank of Ukraine. We've seen a very significant reform uh, in terms of debt centralization, administrative reform, land market reform, some um, improvements in terms of um, digitalization. So I think that current uh, Ukrainian political elites, they have this understanding that policies matter and policies should be delegated to policy makers. Yeah? So that's why we have this rotation of people. But uh, well, I mean, we have a rotation of people who come and go to the government. Uh, I think the merit- meritocratic selection has increased in, in Ukraine for the past years. Nevertheless, there are still you know, issues. It's, it's not perfect. Uh, I think before the war, every month there was a scandal about you know, some corruption or some appointment, uh, especially in the um, judicial system. The court system is something that has to be improved uh, significantly in Ukraine. So, yeah, so I share your sentiment that we should move from emotional, um, emotionally backed up messages to more rigorous and fact-based just development of institutions, organizations, rules, specific social norms. Um, and... Um, yeah, so this is this is absolutely important. The question is, you know, how, how to do that? Yeah, uh, I think it is important for people who surround President Zelensky and his team to remind them about this. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, one of the uh, philosophers, uh, Ukrainian philosophers, um, Mikhail Minakov, he described Zelensky in a very interesting manner that he said that he was a very good president for a political campaign when he... He, he, he was fighting to be elected. He was very sincere and nice and likable. He's a very good president now, again, because he's nice, he's sincere, he's likable. But maybe he was uh, not so good as a president during the peaceful times, yeah, when, when it was necessary just to work. And, mm-hmm. and I hope that you know, after the war ends, there will be a more clear understanding and consolidation of different mm-hmm. groups of society in Ukraine that now we are in the same boat we all have to rebuild uh, the society and we all have to work hard on it, which implies uh, yeah. policies and fact-based and uh, yeah. actions. I, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a question for you, if I may. Um, sure, sure, when, absolutely. When we, uh, when we prepare this conversation, um, and, and you just opened this conversation also by saying that you are, meaning your school is in you know different locations, you're remote, and I wondered, you know, has the pandemic, has the experience of COVID in a way prepared you and perhaps more people in Ukraine to continue to operate as an institution? Obviously, that's different if you're in manufacturing or something. But, it, but for institutions and companies, some companies that can work remotely, it seems to me that the pandemic in a way has prepared you for this war. Is that, is that an overstatement? Uh, I think it's a definitely part of a story. I would say that there are two um, significant uh, events which uh, improved our resilience. So one is definitely pandemic. It is true that a lot of people develop these new techniques and practices, how to work remotely, how to deliver um, uh, supplies, uh, you know, how to run this infrastructure rem- remotely. But there was another one which I mentioned quite briefly, this reform of debt centralization, I think it's, uh, it is overlooked by many, but it was a significant improvement of local governance. So for many years, Ukraine was very centralized society with the central uh, national government deciding on everything, including local uh, spending. Uh, but in 2015, local communities received much, much um, 
uh, stronger sovereignty. Uh, they were able to um, keep tax base uh, in their hands, which incentivized them to open new businesses, uh, but also to spend uh, tax money better on, um, on different services. And our data, sociological data, showed that uh, incrementally uh, quite a lot of Ukrainians improved their trust to local uh, authorities. So people started to trust to mayors, but also people be, uh, experienced this satisfaction with local services. Even during the pandemic, the only uh, satisfaction was with local doctors, family doctors, mm -hmm. but not with uh, national uh, level institutions. We also seen improvement of social capital, meaning that people were more engaged and people attended elections more often. And there was even another small reform. There was this gender quota implemented for local election, which empowered uh, women at, at the local level, which also, I think, improved um, capacity of local governance and local businesses, you know, just to be more active, more creative, um, a bit more wealthy uh, and resourceful. And I think all this in combination with the pandemic uh, significantly uh, improved uh, this resilience uh, to whatever crisis. And it just happened that this crisis is, is the invasion. But I think, um, yeah, but, but my general assessment that pandemic multiplied by previous policies uh, allowed Ukrainians to be more uh, resilient. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you for uh, that's very helpful. Um, to understand the situation. Yeah. Excellent. And I can uh, even tell you some uh, anecdotal stories. You know, right now I'm um, reading so many media channels, social media. I'm volunteer myself and I try to be in touch with everyone else. And people are quite careful in evaluating information. So we read so many social media now and people do what is called um, pre-banking not debunking information, but yeah. pre-banking. So people in advance, they share and they warn each other. Um, yeah. Something like, be careful, maybe this is fake. Or uh, people ask each other about the sources and everything. So I think people now are just alarmed about yeah. the risks of this information, which yeah. improved this culture of being careful. I don't know if this is only temporal thing, you know, during the war, but I hope that people will... Um, keep this habit uh, hmm. after the war as, as well. So how, uh, if you don't mind me following up there, because it's a question that I get a lot from, from um, when people like from students and even from journalists sometimes, how do you deal with a situation currently that the Ukrainian, the information that's coming from the Ukrainian armed forces and Ukrainian government um, obviously is, is sort of tailored to this, situation so we hear and see and hear a lot about russian losses for example um, but not a lot about uh, losses from the ukrainian uh, armed forces and i suspect there's a degree of like uncertainty here that must be i imagine that must be difficult to handle also for you on the ground so how do you deal with this asymmetry of information oh i think the short answer is that people do not pay much attention to that. So it is true that I try to follow different reports. So there are reports by Russian military analysts, by Western analysts, and by Ukrainian government. And the number of casualties, you know, um, is so well, the variation is huge from 2,000 Russian soldiers being dead to 12,000 Russian yeah. soldiers being dead. So, of course, it raises, you know, a question, who, what's going on there? But yeah. from what I see, Ukrainians don't actually, well, from what I observe in my social media circles, you know, and uh, volunteering chats and uh, mainstream media information, uh, this is not in the focus right now. I think mm -hmm. what is in the focus uh, we have a lot of messages about um, humanitarian aid, you know, like people in Mariupol, for instance, or people in Kharkiv, those who, who are uh, in danger. So we are, our 
media is more focused on how many Ukrainians died, how many civilians died, how many kids died. And it does not really matter if you know how many Russian soldiers died. I so I'm afraid to be cynical here, but I think uh, Ukrainian media yeah, yeah. more is more focused on... on, on yeah, that on is that what side. I meant, actually. That, that's mm-hmm. what I meant, actually. The, the Ukrainian, you know, victims on both on the civilian side, but also on the military side, it seems it's also hard to get a more precise, reliable handle on how bad this really is for Ukraine in terms of those numbers. It, or is it is that easier for you? Because I find it very hard. Uh, no, I think it's a fog of war. You know, the data, mm-hmm. well, I personally never trust uh, the data. Uh, well, this is just my approach. Uh, unless I see some, you know, a lot of verifications. Uh, but at least what is happening now is that usually with delays, maybe two or three days, we receive information from the Ministry of, um, uh, it's called reintegration of ter- temporary occupied territories, yeah. uh, because this ministry is now responsible for arranging evacuation in green corridors, and also mm-hmm. prime minister and minister of defense. So they usually coordinate these messages and they tell information about how many buildings were destroyed, how many you know people suffered, how many people died. Mm-hmm. And some of these numbers are quite you know trustworthy. For instance, when they report the number of children who died, uh, mm-hmm. these numbers I well they usually verified because there are you know eyewitnesses mm-hmm. and medical reports. And the numbers are well. I'm afraid to be to come across cynical, but uh, you know the numbers like 100 children is is terrible, but it's not you know thousand. It's not yeah. like they ca- come up with crazy numbers. Yeah, so and other things they just make sense. For instance, if you say that uh, let's say 10,000 people do not have access to electricity. This makes sense because this is approximate number of population who now stays in this small uh, town somewhere in the suburbs. So basically yeah. you can say that everyone who stays there, they don't have access to electricity. Yeah, so so these mm. things make sense. Uh, I think when it, it also makes sense when we're talking about Russian airplanes and helicopters and tanks, because you can videotape that, you can actually count it, you can use... Uh, digital technologies to look from yeah. um, from the satellites. So these things can be easily verified, but in terms of actual number of people who died, yeah, I, I don't think that it can be easily collected. Now, I think they use mm. some calculus, for instance, if, if they shut down the tank, they just multiply it by four because mm. four people should be in the tank or something like that. Yeah. So I don't know the exact sources, but frankly, I think what I said a couple of minutes ago that people don't really don't really care if 10,000 of people died and, you know, Russian soldiers on 15 or 2,000. Yeah. People more yeah. care about their own safety, you know, yeah, yeah, humanitarian sure. thing. Yeah. And uh, so I, 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 I never seen, a, I've never seen a debate about numbers in, in Ukrainian media. Mm-hmm. You know, people just mm-hmm. take it for granted and they, okay. and they accept it. Uh, mm-hmm. I think maybe in the future there will be a debate like that, but I, I don't think it is going to happen during the war. Hmm. Well, thank you again. Um, I feel bad because I shouldn't be the one asking questions. No, no, absolutely. It's a, it's a conversation. So I'm actually, I'm practicing now. Uh, this is the first ever uh, recording, which we can call a podcast. Yeah. So I think it was more a podcast conversation. So yeah, I should I, guess. I, I, I should practice how to do that and <laughs> ask and answer. Excellent. Um, are we go- going for one hour? Is this essentially we're coming to an end now, aren't we? Yeah, you're right. We are coming to an end. And um, I, I just want to say thank you very much for your conversation. I, I think, you know, you, you talked about history, but you, you talked about uh, um, structural conditions of disinformation. And also we talked about, you know, moral dilemmas. I really enjoyed this conversation and also I want to emphasize it and I want to say it on, on record that we are all very grateful to have you uh, as a speaker because, you know, this is a very difficult time for Ukrainian students and scholars and these lectures of solidarity are very important for us and, you know, this ability to talk with um, scholars, intellectuals is, is very important. 
And I will plug in one thing before we um, end the conversation. I want to promote our donation page. I put it in comment section on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, here as well. Um, right now, our own university is engaged in, um, in this donation campaign. So we try to collect money to support uh, humanitarian needs of Ukrainians. We specifically purchase um, bulletproof vests, helmets, and medical kits. And the thing is that we work on the ground, so we know what kind of stuff is needed on the, on the ground, and we know how to organize this logistics. And uh, the fundraising which we um, have organized is our donation fund is registered in uh, Washington, D.C., so it is transparent. You can send money there in euro, in dollars, in crypto. American organizations can expect uh, tax deductions. So um, we will be very helpful for any donation. You know, $20, $50 can save life somewhere in Ukraine. So um, I appreciate your donations um, in advance. So thank you very much. And Thomas, um, again, thank you. Thank you very much Absolutely. for your participation. And, and, I and I hope to uh, repeat this uh, at some point in a not too distant future in person in Kyiv, uh, which I would very much look forward to. Absolutely. We would love to have you uh, presenting to our students in person and walking in a peaceful Kiev, drinking coffee or wine or whatever you prefer.